before sin enters in. And it doesn't take long to when Moses takes the people out from Egypt after they see this mighty sign of the red opening that they fall into idolatry with the golden calf. Sin is always lurking at the door of your church in your life. Sin is always there to break in and cause confusion and take you away from your God-ordained uh, purposes. And Ariok quickly brought Daniel before the king and said thus to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who had made will make known to the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Do you also, are you able to know a dream that I didn't tell you because I killed all these other guys because they couldn't tell me the dream that I didn't tell them? Kind of mean. But see, God wants to show off here. And God's going to show off with his humble servant, Daniel. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. Daniel answered in the presence of the king, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and soothsayers cannot declare to the king. In times past, all these guys can do things like that. Once again, interpreting uh, dreams is not just the business of Daniel. It's, in, it's a business of other people like soothsayers and magicians and uh, tarot card readers and all that, mediums and wizards. That They all can do that. They've been around since the beginning of time. It's not... Hocus pocus, it's, it's, it's real stuff. Some people do it, it's all phony baloney, but if, they, if, they, if they're incantating to Satan and they're, they're operating in a satanic way, they can do it. Satan gives them power to do it. But here's what Daniel says in verse 28. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. That's important to remember. King Nebuchadnezzar, your dream and the visions upon your head or in your head on your bed were these. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while, while you were on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, the secret has not been revealed to me because I am more I have more wisdom than anyone living. But for our sakes, me and my friends from Judah who make known the interpretation to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. You, O king, were and behold a great image. Okay, we're going to go to Revelation where we were yesterday and we're going to read And a dragon stood on the sand of the sea shore. It's Revelation 13, 1. And I saw a, gre a great beast, or I saw a beast coming out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and his great authority. You, O king, were watching and behold a great image. An image. An idol. But it's great. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you and its form was awesome. The image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Each of these layers represented kingdoms. The gold represented Babylon, not only in the immediate history of being a world empire, but in the fact that it is the head, it is the greatest. It is still the greatest. Babylon is still the greatest. And then the next was the Medes and the Persians. And that was silver. The belly and the thighs were of bronze. That was uh, Alexander the Great and the Greeks. And then we have the uh, legs of iron 
and its feet are partly of iron and partly of clay, representing the Roman Empire. And all this came to pass, and it blows people's minds that Daniel and the king interpreted to detail the next phase of kingdoms. And you watched while a stone was cut out without hands. This is critical to what's next. Which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. This stone is going to strike what? The feet. It's going to fight. It's going to strike the feet. Then the iron. Well, let's just say this. I just want to stop right here. We're going to know, and if, you, if you've read this before and prayed over it before, you'll know that this stone represents Jesus and the power of his ministry. That it is not made with hands, it is heavenly. And it has power to break the Roman Empire, right? Well, who killed Jesus? Well, the Jews delivered him over to the Roman Empire, which sanctioned his death. They, they executed him. But his resurrection power, his ascension on high, his, his presenting his body a, a living sacrifice to God, the sprinkling of his blood, and the power of his ministry in the lives of men, the Israel of God, will one day crush the Roman Empire. Has that ever happened? I don't want to the Catholic Church and all that. The Roman Empire has to be rebuilt because Christ has to kill and destroy that empire, wipe it out. And when we get into Revelation, we're going to see that the Roman Empire has a linkage to the harlot, the great harlot, and the beast has a linkage to Babylon. Right? The two are the power uh, brokers. Then the iron and the clay and the bronze and the silver and the gold were crushed together. This stone not only is going to crush the Roman Empire, well, it will crush the entire image and become like chaff from the summer threshing floors. Check this out. We are going to go um, to Revelation chapter 14, verse 14. Then I looked and behold, a white cloud sitting on the, a white cloud and sitting on the cloud was one like the son of man, the stone that was not made with men's hands, having a golden crown, which represents authority, power, absolute. A golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle was in his hand. And another angel out of the temple. Where's the temple? It's up above this white cloud in the glory. It's out of heaven. And his loud voice said to him who sat on the cloud, put your sickle and reap. Put out your sickle, put in your sickle and reap. For the hour to reap has come because the harvest of the earth is ripe. What's making it ripe? Well, what's making it ripe is the quick movement of the beast and the empire that he's creating. The beast is effectively getting the whole world to come after this strong delusion through lying tongue, signs and wonders, through intimidation. This beast and his prophet are taking over the world. So, that's a harvest that has to be brought in. And it's going to be brought in by the Son of Man who sits on the white cloud with the golden, thrown, golden crown on his head. Then he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. Then another angel, the one power over fire, came out of the altar, fire, altar, refining, judgment, See, the fire refines, but the fire also judges. And those of us who submitted to the rulership of Jesus Christ have gone into the fire that Jesus has called us to because of the fire baptism. When he gives you the Holy Spirit and you submit to him in every area of your life, he gives you the fire. That's the passion and the burning that has been here since the beginning of time in his people those who are called to war for his cause on the earth. 
So we go into the fire before.